friends, we spoke about four emotional stresses. We spoke about first guilt and shame. Then we spoke about what? Fear. Third, we spoke about anger and hatred and, and sorrow and despair. Four basic emotional stresses of our mind. Psychologists today, modern psychologists will tell us these are the four basic emotional problems of our life. All the other emotional stresses can be classified into these four emotional consequences. Emotional stresses, emotional complexes, inferiority, and sadness, and suicidal tendencies, and whatever other emotional problems we have, all our emotional problems can be classified into these four basic emotional problems of our life. Let me explain to you these four emotional problems of our life. You know why? What Jesus is going to do is to come into every such area of our life and heal us. Heal us. These emotional problems have come to us from our childhood. Not only from our childhood, even from the first moment of our conception in the womb of our mothers. You know, the church teaches us, and all the scientists would agree, we were a human being, not only from the moment we were born, but from the moment we were conceived in the womb of our mothers. From that moment, we were a human being able to feel, able to feel. And in those moments, if we were accepted, if we were encouraged, if we were respected, we would have grown up as very positive individuals. What do we mean by positive, happy, cheerful, optimistic individuals? From that moment to this day, if we were discouraged, unaccepted, and abandoned, then we would have grown up as very negative individuals. Negative meaning unhappy, criticizing, finding fault with others, and unable to perform in life. Into every such negative attitude of our life, Jesus wants to come. These negative attitudes is what I called the wounds the wounds of our heart. Into such wounds of our heart, Jesus wants to come as the good shepherd to heal us. Let me give you a few examples, a few examples in order that we may be able to identify ourselves. We may be able to understand ourselves what went wrong with us? You know, psychologists today will tell us our basic mental formation 
was almost completed by the age of six or seven. By the age of six or seven. In those early years of our life, whatever happened to us has been decisive in our psychological formation. In those early years, if we were accepted and recognized and loved, then we would have grown up as very positive individuals. In those early years of our life, if we were rejected and unrecognized, if we failed in our attempts, then we would have grown up as very negative individuals. And that's why I said our experiences in those early years would have been very decisive in our mental makeup. So when we look into our past, we will look very, very clearly into our early childhood. And the Lord will enable us to look into our childhood that we may offer whatever we remember to the Lord and whatever we don't remember the Lord will take care hallelujah thank you Jesus praise you Jesus remember a drunkard came here for retreat in fact, he was brought here in a very, uh, very bad situation. He was totally drunk. So the first day, I did not talk to him. There's no point of talking to a drunk, drunkard because he, is, he was uh, in a very bad situation. Second day of the retreat, I called him to my room and he would not even look at me. He was so sad, ashamed of himself. And I asked him, my friend, how are you? Looking down, he said, Father, please forgive me. I said, my friend, look up. And he said, Father, I'm very ashamed of myself because I made a mess of my life. My wife hates me. My children despise me. I don't blame them because I have not done any good to them so far. It's all my mistake. I have, I have really made a mess of my life. I have been drinking all my life. All the money I get, I wasted in the bottle. And I don't know what to do. I thought of committing suicide, but I'm afraid to commit suicide. And that's why I'm living at all. Tell me, Father, what to do. I told him, my friend, you are ashamed of yourself. You're feeling very guilty. But I told him, Jesus does not want you to feel guilty. Jesus does not want you to be ashamed of yourself. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. Jesus is the good shepherd. He wants to bind up your wounds. You are a wounded person. I spoke to him in detail about his past. I realized 
he himself had a father who was a drunkard. It was his father who introduced him into drinking. Well, I, I told him, what Jesus wants is not that he feel dejected and discouraged and ashamed. I told him, there's a lot of difference between guilt and repentance. It's good for us to know this. Repentance is not guilt feeling. The two are very different. In guilt feeling, there is shame. In repentance, there is hope. In guilt feeling, I look into my own sin. In repentance, I look at the face of Jesus. And guilt feeling leads us to despair. But repentance leads us to great hope in Jesus. I told him, Jesus is waiting to come into every time you drank. I told him, you may not know the number of times you drank, but Jesus knows. I quoted to him Psalm 56, Psalm 56, 8, where God says, I have counted your afflictions. I have collected your tears in my bottle. I told him the Lord knows every time you were afflicted by Satan. It was Satan who led you into drinking every time. And the Lord has counted every such moment. And every time you drank a little addiction power, addictive power was added, added to your heart and became more and more a drunkard and addictive power was added to you and you became an addict and the Lord has counted it all and the Lord wants to come to every such moment and take away, take away that evil power from you. That's a promise of the good shepherd to come to every such wounded moment and set you free. And he was shocked to hear that. He was shocked. I said, don't be shocked. That's a promise of Jesus. I will come, Jesus said. I will come to, to your wounds, every wounded moment, and set you free. And I spoke to him a number of times. He remained here for a whole month. In the beginning, he had withdrawal symptom for a couple of days. But, but when he began to believe in the great love of the Lord, that withdrawal symptom vanished. He was amazed at the great love of God. So amazed that he began to believe in God's great love for him. And at the end of the month, he became so transformed. It was not a medical treatment. Rather, it was a healing event, a process of healing that the good shepherd carried out in his life, became so filled with the love of the Lord. He went out. In fact, after that, he sent his friends who were drinking with him. He sent all of them here for a retreat. And after a few months, he started a prayer group with all of them to support them 
and more and more people join his prayer group. Today, that prayer group is thriving as a sign of hope for all the people who were addicted to drinking and drugs. And that prayer group is thriving in that particular parish. And this, is, this man is the leader of that prayer group. Shall we say praise the Lord for that? Hallelujah. 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 My dear sisters and brothers, this is the healing process of Jesus. Healing by God's love. The inner healing that Jesus effects in our hearts, drinking or any other evil power, Jesus is able to heal by his love. The love of God is omnipotent, all-powerful. What is needed is an inner healing. Even if you go to a rehabilitation center, you may fall back into drinking or drugs. But then, but then, if you are filled with the love of God, you will never fall back into drinking. The person who goes into drinking or any other uh, evil power like drugs, even smoking, what happens to him and to her is this shame, shame that comes to him or to her. The shame and an inferiority. The shame will be taken away only by love. When the person knows I'm loved, I'm loved by my God, when that experience of love fills the heart, there is a new hope. My God is there for me. My God will heal me. My God loves me. And that's the love that we need to open our, our heart to. The second, second area that we need our healing for is fear. Fear. Fear is a very dangerous area dangerous area that stifles us. There could be layers of fear that get accumulated in our hearts. And fear can be so dangerous that we can, we can even lose the balance of our mind. A lot of people today who go for psychiatric treatment are those having fear. The fear can become so acute that one may have to go for a psychiatric treatment. But then fear, if we go to Jesus and offer our fear to the Lord, the Lord can easily heal us of that fear. I remember talking to a young lady doctor. This young lady doctor shared with me her problem. She used to get panic attacks. And since she was highly educated, she knew why she was getting those panic attacks. But she was sort of um, shy to reveal the reason of the panic attacks. She had those attacks even from her adolescent time. And she revealed that problem to me. When she was studying in the high school, she was going to the school from her village, from the mud road, village mud road, she turned to the other 
bigger road and a beggar was sitting there the beggar saw her and she passed by slowly the beggar got up and made a noise and the beggar began to follow her she was scared to scared and the beggar clapped his hand asked her to stop she was most frightened she began to run and the beggar began to run after her she was all the more frightened and she ran for her life and the beggar threw his stick at her and she was extremely frightened she ran frightened she escaped but then when she reached the school the whole day she was sort of shivering with fear the beggar had a long beard and whenever she saw a person with a beard she would get a chill down her spine that night for the first time she got a panic attack all sorts of wild dreams began to attack her at the night in the night she was a very clever student so she studied well and even when she became a doctor this panic attacks began to haunt her i i told her my sister you know why you get those panic attacks because that fear you had in your young age i i spoke to her opening the word of god the great promise of god the promise of god i will never leave you alone god's promise to be with us always a promise god gives every one of us so personally i will never leave you alone and i prayed for her but i prayed for her i got one verse one verse so clearly let me read that verse for you this is from isaiah isaiah chapter 41 verse 13 that verse god gave me as a message for her isaiah chapter 41 verse 13 for i am the lord your god who grasp your right hand it is i who said to you fear not i will help you for i am the lord your god who grasp your right hand it is i who said to you fear not i will help you i told her my sister this is what god is telling you i am the lord your god who grasp your right hand i am telling you fear not i will help you i told her to repeat this message god is giving you she began to repeat it every now and then during the inner healing prayer service she felt she felt jesus was whispering this message to her 
very personally. I am the Lord your God. I grasp your right hand. I am telling you, fear not. And she felt a great joy filling her heart. An assurance. The Lord whispering to her, holding her right hand. Fear not. I am with you. But that experience filled her heart. From that moment, later, years after, when she saw me, she told me, Father, from that experience, from that moment, she never got panic attacks anymore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you.